Petroleum Engineering established in 2011. He has over 28 years of experience as a petroleum engineer in heavy, medium, and light oil fields and gas fields, including naturally fractured reservoirs. His expertise provides practical leadership and guidance to integrate technical, operational, and financial aspects of the oil and gas business, yielding successful project outcomes and best returns for clients. Carlos and his team have worked with multiple reservations across the United States. And then my MI3 Petroleum Engineering currently operates assets for tribal entities in the Rockies. Please welcome Mr. Carlos. So I'm going to start. Can you hear me over there? Good? Okay, perfect. Okay. So I only have 15 slides, but hopefully um, we're going to spark a little bit of uh, a conversation, more than a presentation. Um, a little bit about MI3, we mostly are a bunch of engineers, geologists, petrophysics, uh, master's degrees, PhDs, and you name it, right? Um, we started by doing a lot of um, consulting work, technical work, uh, for many years. From the technical work, we um, started getting more and more involved into the application of that technical work until we end up operating assets for clients. So we have been involved in designing and even implementing EOR projects. For example, Devon Energy, they, they used to operate two CO2 EOR assets in the Rockies. We designed those for them. They sold that to Denbury, and now Denbury sold everything to us. And we have been involved in a lot of the CO2 EOR operations, except the one that you have here. Uh, but we have consulted for a lot of groups, uh, not only in CO2, but nitrogen injection, uh, a lot of thermal, for sure. So we have been collecting a lot of um, experience here and there. And I'm going to share with you what we have seen here in the research. So here we go. So we're going to talk a little bit about our experience. Then um, we did a, a small study in the Osage Nation, uh, I think like two or three years ago, which we share the findings. Um, what we see as the challenges that you have moving forward. Um, every place has unique circumstances. And one thing that I always hear in every different place that I go is, here is unique. Yeah, it's unique everywhere. So that is not an excuse. Uh, what is the difference between successful and unsuccessful cases, right? Um, a little bit of MI3 background, we have worked with majors, uh, and you know, not only major oil and gas companies, but even major investment groups, even international trading companies. We have worked for banks, investment groups, right? Um, we have worked in the Middle East, uh, we have done work in Asia, South America, North America, a lot of heavy oil, medium and light. Um, we have done enhanced oil recovery, including steam injection, SACD, um, CO2, uh, you name it. And we work with um, multiple reservations in the country, too. Uh, one of the things that we have learned through all these years is that we try to solve 
problems from the engineering point of view. So there is strategic business advice, which sometimes is just financially speaking, how you can solve a problem from that point of view. Uh, what we try to do is solve it from the engineering point of view, and then incorporate all the other pieces in there, the financial piece, the operational piece, the legal piece, etc., etc. Uh, we have worked with other reservations. Uh, we have done a ton of technical work for them, and we have provided also advice and business support in their business initiatives. We operate oil and gas for other reservations, no leases, right? And here is something that is very different. We operate for other reservations, and we have been able to create, and I'm not saying that this is possible here, every place is different, but for other reservations we operate for them, they pay no conservation tax, no advertising tax, no selling tax, no production tax, right? No state tax, and of course, no federal tax. And all those savings go directly to them, right? We don't hold the leases, which is basically are very creative in how we put together these business models to favor the client. We work for a fee, period, right? Straightforward, simple. Um, we are a critical piece um, to the business model in other reservations, too. Um, not everywhere the same business model works, but we can get in and through time, we need to define what is the final objective, come back and uh, decide what, how we get there, and then plug the pieces, right? For the OSET, OSET nation, we, uh, two or three years ago, we did a little bit of an entire screening for the entire area to get a feeling for what is the upside potential that you have. What are the technologies that, that could work here, right? So we did that high level potential. The good news is this, huge, huge upside potential, but it's not simple. In order to pursue that potential, you're gonna need large upfront capital that probably you don't have, right? And in order to get there, you're gonna need external sources or partners. And in order to attract those partners, those banks, or those investors, you may need to consider to change the business model as is today, right? May not work for them, right? As I said earlier, we took a look at the entire area. Um, one of the challenges was to get reliable data. That is a problem. As you know, these fields are very, very old, and a lot of that data is not necessarily good. So we did the best that we could with the data that we have. But again, that is not an excuse. Everywhere we go in the United States, most of the data is very old. So we have learned to deal with a lot of data. This is the things that are very interesting that we found out. There is a lot of oil and gas in a lot of places inside the nation. Some very good, some good, and some so-so. There is a lot of different groups, there is a lot of different operators, there is a lot of different ideas going around. And there is not a single consolidated plan yet, right? That's what, what we notice. One of the things that we did, and uh, one database that we own, is not public, we put together that database and took years to put it together, is that we have collected data from every EOR project out there. Everything that we could, production data, injection data, all their process, permeability, everything. And then we put a database together. Why did we do that? Because what we wanted to do for clients is to be able to say, look, I'm gonna take your field and I'm gonna benchmark that field against a database of successful cases and then tell you, more or less, what we see here, if you are ballpark, right. If, if you are there, then and you decide to move forward with that project, then you can hire Barbara, and she can do all the next level science that we need to go do it, right? But if you do this, and over here you see a lot of red flags, don't hire Barbara, right? 
Um, so what we want to do is make sure that we benchmark your oil fields across the um, reservation. This is just one example, and what you can see here is that each of these red dots is one field experience, right? Your field is, in this case, a target field is that green dot that you see there, right? And then we go around and we compare, let's say, average depth, average temperature, porosity, IPI gravity, net pay, uh, initial pressure, permeability, size, cumulative, et cetera, et cetera. And then you see uh, more or less across the board if once we do what we call this benchmark screening, if the assets or the oil fields that you have are within the range of successful experiences. If you are way outside the range, that is a concern. So when you park that variable in a different place, and then we can address those issues later on. How do we tackle with that problem? Is that a no-no, or is something that you can engineer later on, right? So we did this with basically a lot of the fields that you have in the OSAS nation, but we kind of tried to cover kind of a, a trend in there to get an idea of how this looks like across the entire reservation, right? Then once we finish this, we basically summarize what we think are the enhanced oil recovery methods that are viable for you. I'm going to pause here for a little bit because yesterday I was having a conversation in the back with a group of ladies, and I feel like it is very important that we all have a common understanding of what is enhanced oil recovery. Does everybody know that, or do we need a little bit more explanation? Yes, okay, here. So if you look at the life of an oil field, typically, there are three phases, right? The first phase is primary production. That means everybody rush into here and they drill like crazy. It's mainly driven by drilling. And what happens is your oil, your reservoir, has a lot of pressure and energy. And you pop those holes and that fluid comes out of the rock naturally, right? Once that comes out naturally, then maybe they put a little bit of pumping system to help it move that up, right? And through time, that production declines. Gets to a point that maybe you start making little money or not enough money. Then it comes to the next step. Typically, the next step is considered secondary recovery, which is water flow. So what they do now is they take some of the other wells, they turn that into an injection well, you pump water, that water pressurizes the system, but also the water pushes that oil and that oil being pushed now can get back. So you get another pump on production. That's secondary. And you can do that only for a certain amount of time. Uh, and after that, that will decline to, to a point that is almost uneconomic, right? Then it comes tertiary recovery. Tertiary recovery now it means other methods. You can inject gases. And when we say gases, multiple gases. You can do air, pure nitrogen, CO2, natural gas, right? That is kind of more or less in the group of the gases. There are some type of oil that are heavy, and they benefit is from injecting heat so that you can reduce the viscosity of that oil, and you can get it out of the ground, right? That, those are called thermal processes and can be in the form of steam, cycle, continuous, etc. Then you have the group of the chemicals. In the chemicals, there is surfactant, there is polymers, there is mixed combinations, etc. So I'm going to give you a little bit of perspective in the United States, how much we produce out of each group. It's almost 60% of all the enhanced oil recovery in the country, it is from gas injection in the form of CO2, number one. You have some nitrogen projects here and there, and also miscible hydrocarbon gas, which is the gas that you don't have a home for that gas, right? You can reject it back. So the simplicity of that process, coupled with the cost, and also a kind of a wide understanding across the industry, makes this to be number one. 60% of our production is from there. 
around 38-39% of all enhanced solar recovery production in the United States comes from thermal. That is in the form of injecting steam or something similar to steam. So it's heating up the rock. Between 1 and 2% is chemical. Don't get mad at me, guys. That's what it is. So the reason I think chemical has not has more success, it is harder to understand. It is more complicated, right? And as there is a lot less understanding, there is also a lot less application. It seems like the industry can get a little bit easier or digest the gas injection processes, right? Uh, there is also necessarily has some, needs some conditions for it to be successful, right? Um, that linked to the historical part that natural gas was available everywhere when they didn't have a house or a home for the natural gas, then natural gas was the very first type of gas injection type of projects that you did for you are. So going back, you have primary production, secondary production, tertiary production. In the entire area here, you have almost every field, almost, I'm not going to say all of them, are candidate for gas injection, right? The depth, it is just there, it is right. The type of oil density or viscosity, the type of, the type of porosity that you have, the geologic conditions, the reservoir properties, the fluid properties are favorable for gas injection processes. When you look across the gas injection processes, you have CO2 as one of the best processes that you have out there, mainly because of the properties of the CO2. CO2 has a higher density and a higher viscosity. So the mobility ratio, which it means how that CO2 displaces the oil out of the ground, it is more favorable than compared to, let's say, natural gas or nitrogen, right? Inside CO2, you have two forms. One's going to be miscible, right? Miscible, it means when we inject that CO2, the CO2 will get together with the oil they form only one phase that you cannot differentiate, right? It's like if I put CO2 and oil together, they all will be here in this phase, in the water phase, right? Then you have the immiscible, which is if the pressure, temperature, oil properties are not the right, then when you inject the CO2, you will see two phases. So if you put it in a bottle, you should be able to see the CO2 phase in one section of the bottle and the oil in the other section of the bottle. So they will not be mixing and combining into one phase. The miscible always generates higher return because it has a better swap efficiency. The immiscible is not necessarily bad. If you have the right economic conditions, it still can be successful. It's just about now if you have the right economics. right? So in the entire area, we have options for both, for miscible and immiscible CO2 flow. Now comes the question, which everybody that is going to apply a CO2 UR project, the first, que the first question is, how risky it is? We have already a group that is that are risking the CO2 UR in these type of reservoirs, which is perfect. You have already a major, major commercial scale project that has proven that you can do CO2 successfully in, in, in this area, right? Now we're going to look at, once we talk about CO2, now you can say, well, instead of EOR, why don't we do sequestration, right? And today, everybody is sequestration, 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 and it seems like there's a lot of push for that, right? Uh, there's a lot of political pressure. So I just copied this table here so that my numbers in here is how much you get per ton, right? So in theory today you get almost $41 per, per metric ton, going to 50. Uh, and if you do EOR, you get close to $28 per metric ton, going to 35. There are some things in there that will change both numbers, right? But they can both move up and down, uh, depending on how you do this. So I have bachelor degree, two masters, but if I cannot convince myself with fifth grade math, we got a problem, right? We got a problem. So I don't need a, three PhDs to give me 
complicated theory or mathematics or financial models if I cannot convince myself with this. So we're going to do that exercise here for a second, right? Um, this is going to be very simple, but it's just for illustrating the point. On the left-hand side, we have CO2 carbon sequestration. Because remember, carbon sequestration can be methane, right? Let's say $41 per metric ton today, increasing to $50 by 2026, you get no oil production, right? You gotta be careful, no oil production. If you produce something, it cannot be qualified as carbon capture sequestration, so you're gonna have to shut down things. That means you're losing revenue on one side, right? Losing, but let's not put any losses in here on that column for a while. The regulatory and um, permitting, you know, it's a nightmare, period. You, have, you saw by representation, right? They require a lot of data. You're gonna have to hire a lot of experts to get all the data that they want. And we all make a lot more money doing that for you. You wanna go there, hire me. You know, that's awesome for us, but it's not a great idea for you. Simple economics, for every metric ton, this is how much you make. It's gonna be around $41 per ton that you inject into the ground, minus whatever is the cost of bringing that CO2 here. Bringing the CO2 here is not gonna be cheap, right? You're gonna to have to have a capture facility somewhere. You're gonna to have to have an infrastructure to bring the CO2 to this place, right? While the location is very, very ideal because you're in the middle of everything, still it's gonna cost a lot of money, right? So the CO2 is not gonna be free. Something it's gonna cost here. But in 2026, maybe it's 50, and again, minus whatever the CO2 cost it is, right? That's per metric ton. So now let's go about the other side. You are not gonna get $41 per metric ton, you're gonna get around 28. Then that will move to 35 by 2026. But this is the beauty. We have a database with 55 field experiences of CO2 EOR in the US. On average, when you start a CO2 fraud, you get a very good response early on. And you can get up to two barrels incremental. That is in addition of what you produce, right? And you could see the example with permit. Most of the production is from the incremental CO2 even when they are flooding only 30% of the entire field, right? So you're flooding 30% of the field, and that 30% is giving you most of the production of the entire field, right? That, that keeps that in mind. So you're getting between one barrel to two barrels for every metric ton that you inject on the ground, right? Because that CO2, if it's miscible or immiscible, pushes some of that oil towards the producers and then you get that oil back, right? So on average, let's kind of make a deal one and a half. And you don't have to deal with all class six stuff that is so complicated. What you deal with? Typical oil and gas regulation and permitting, right? I'm not saying it's simple, but we know how to do that. The entire industry knows how to do that, right? Uh, is kind of more standard type of thing. Not the complicated, complex nightmare here for, for the sequestration, right? So that is a lot simpler here. So simple economics. Today, you will be making $28 per metric ton. And one and a half barrel for every metric ton that I produce. So if I assume the oil price of oil is 75, and I'm gonna make an assumption that the cost of producing a barrel of oil is steady. So my net is 45 times one and a half times, I'm making $95 minus whatever the CO2 cost it is. Because if I'm gonna bring CO2 from anywhere here, it doesn't make any difference, right? The infrastructure, this and this and that, if I'm gonna do it one way or the other way, there may be slight differences on the quality and where I'm gonna do this, and that is gonna influence the cost. But as of today, we're making more than twice with a much less complicated regulatory system. Let's see, after year 2026, you're making 
hundred for arithmetic tone. Now, I'm going to pause here. Fifth grade math. What are we talking here? Right? All this sounds really good, but not for you. I will do sequestration if I have no oil to produce. If I have an oil field to produce, I'm going to use this CO2 to increase my production. That will make me much, much profitable. When my CO2 EOR project is reaching uneconomic <coughs> levels, what should we do then? Try to turn it back into a sequestration project. Maximize your profit while you can. And then when the production side doesn't generate the revenue that you want, migrate from one system to the other one, if possible. I'm not saying that it's going to be simple. Right? We don't need rocket science for this, right? I don't trust that. So moving forward, what will be the challenges here? Right? These are the challenges. Infrastructure. Where is that CO2 coming from? Right? We need CO2 sources. What is the quality of the CO2? What is the size of that source? What is the rate? How much can we get for a certain amount of time? Right? That is going to create complications for you, regardless of what direction you end up going, right? Um, well war conditions. Most of the well wars here are not good for CO2. That's it, period. You, 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 they are too old, too corroded. Then you're going to need injection facilities, but you're going to need it anyway if you do sequestration, right? On the other side, you, and, and on the other hand, you have ownership. Very complicated here. So now you, it depends. If the conversation is EOR, the poor space conversation goes away. Can you believe that? Are we injecting CO2 anyway? But if I say I'm doing CO2 EOR, suddenly there is no discussion about what's happening here, about who owns the poor space. Because I'm doing it for the purpose of what? Producing oil. So that goes away. We don't need to litigate anything, right? But if I say sequestration, wait a second, who owns that poor space? Now we're talking, the, the conversation is different, right? More complicated. Now you have complicated ownership, but it's the same everywhere. You have landowners, you have head rights, you have the nation, you have different groups, right? You have so many different operators here. Not everybody has the same idea. And then you have capital needs. It's going to be huge. Doesn't matter which way you go. If it's sequestration or you are, you are going to need a lot of money, which is probably going to require outsiders, right? You're going to have to have a long-term vision. And in order to do that size of investment and to have a long-term vision, you need to have political stability, right? Uh, otherwise, this is not going to happen. And then you're going to have to deal with the regulatory, doesn't matter what. So in order for this to happen, we're going to have to go back to biology, right? And say, we have to adapt, right? In order to be able to be successful as a business model, the ones that typically survive and thrive and grow are the ones that adapt, are not the richest or are not the smartest, are the most flexible ones, right? And what was good in the early days may not be what we need for the future. The business model may not be necessarily good for all the needs that you have moving forward, right? And why is this worth, why should we adapt? Keep this in mind, worldwide statistics. Primary production, 35, 25 to 35%, right? Secondary production, between 10 and 25%, right? Tertiary production, around between 10%, sometimes 15%. So let's go back. You have produced, I'm going to make it round numbers, over a billion barrels of oil, right? That is your primary production. Right? Assume that that is your 30 or 35%. Make sense? 
if you divide that right by 35 percent and you now try to calculate how much is your 10 percent that is over 100 million barrels in the most conservative of the cases so this size of the price in this county is worthy to adapt you know what i mean if you use benchmark numbers for enhanced oil recovery and you assume that you can get another 10 percent only 10 percent of what you have there it is probably way over 100 million miles it is going to be successful everywhere no and probably we're going to be 50 percent wrong this is still a big number right so in order to go there we have to set the right conditions for business to thrive for the business to be able to have the long-term stability that it requires and to bring the investment that you need to enable those type of projects otherwise it won't happen i'm going to show you cases unsuccessful cases and of course i'm not going to pick any tribe right that is not going to happen because then that would be the, the end of my services with tribal people right i'm going to use my own country i grew up in venezuela I'm portuguese grew up in venezuela and then moved here 20 years ago um, venezuela let's talk about potential like you have a lot of potential right ton of potential on the ground here good venezuela number one in the world a lot of people talk about saudi arabia but wait 300 billion barrels of oil in reserves oil production in 1998 was 3.5 million barrels oil production in 2023 just less than a million right big drop per capita gdp in the 1950s we were fourth in the world it was switzerland US, then there was one other country, Venezuela. Really good, huh? And there are some kind of similarities in here, right? Per capita GDP, 2023, 129 in the world, right? Takeaways, potential doesn't mean anything. If you don't have the right business structures that can attract companies, investors, bankers, people, thinkers to work with you, that doesn't mean anything. If you want to argue that, I'll buy you a ticket. Go to, to the regular Venezuelan guy there and ask him if potential means something for them. He won't. And not only to the regular Joe back there, even for any shareholder of anything, if you're a shareholder of a shop, or a service group, or whatever, today you lost a lot of value, right? And with what, what happened here is very, very kind of fixation with one type of business model, not being able to adapt how the changes happened between 1950 and 2023, right? In addition to politics, right? That, that is a prime example. But like Venezuela, there are places in the US where uh, the changes have not occurred and there is resistance to change. Guess what? You're gonna own 100% of nothing. That's not gonna go well with anybody. I prefer to own a little bit of something than 100% of nothing. Each country have their own and unique uh, circumstances, same with each tribe that we have worked with. Uh, but that is not an excuse. You just have to sit down and align all the pieces with a lot of respect, talk about the things that we need, and get the work done, right? I'm going to talk about a successful case. This is a, actually a reservation that I do work with, right? I'm not going to mention the name. I'm going to show, share the history. Oil production in this reservation dropped. 70% in the last 50 years. Gas production dropped 90% in the last 50 years. So, what do you think is gonna to happen to the revenue? Of course, it dropped multiples, right? So they used to be very good, today they're not making that much money. Not only that, to make things worse, there's two tribes sharing the same land, two different groups, different interests, right? So, complicated, very different, 
very difficult politics in here. Mm. And like everybody else, they have a unique set of circumstances, right? Geographically, politically, their law, their relationship with BIA, the federal government, etc. We started working with them almost four years ago, and we were able to basically design what is it that we wanted. There was this approach that we need to change, and each of them decided to basically give away something that they didn't want to give away. In exchange, they want something. They want the hope that maybe things can go in a different direction. Because if you look at the last 50 years, the trajectory was pretty clear going down, right? No change, what do you think is gonna happen? You keep going down. And that's the case everywhere where you see that trend going down and you don't wanna face the reality, you're gonna keep going down, right? So they recognize that, they made the changes, we start working with them and define first what is it that we want as a business. Once we define what were the objectives, then we brought in the lawyers. Don't bring the lawyers first, right? You bring the lawyers with a clear path and plan and say, this is what you do, this is what I want. Is this legal is legally possible? Not let's work around that, but that's where we agree that we want to go first. Then you bring the legal team. Then we started with one field, producing for them. Then we start, from there we move to a second field. Now we have four fields. Guess where we're going? We're gonna take everything for them. Everything, if we can, right? They're gonna end up owning everything in that reservation. Has to be that way? No. There is opportunities to partner with people. There is opportunities to do it. Why not? I think that's the best way to do it. When people don't want to do it that way, there is other ways then, right? Um, what happened there? We hired 100% tribal people there. They work for us, they actually operate, they help us operate. Um, we have a viable path to an economic and social growth. They are making, and I cannot say, multiples of what they were making before in just two years. Right? And things are looking like they can do a lot more if we tackle the future challenges, right? So this is two sides, two sides. One of them, a country which resisted the change, stick with the plan that they used to have in the 1950s. Um, basically, they dropped more than 100 spots in what we call economic growth or, or quality of life. We have one tribe right here in the US that decided to uh, face the challenges, make the changes, and they started to see the results. Is this gonna happen everywhere? Maybe not. But it's worth it to try, I think, right? A lot more work to do there, right? So, suggestions. This is what I, I see when I came here the first time, and I still see this today, right? I'm gonna imagine that Bill over here works for BlackRock, right? And maybe you work for Big Bank, Big Bank of America. And I am the whole situation. I come to you and I say, hey, you know, I have all these plans. Oh yeah, okay, let me look at it, right? Now I talk to you and I say, hey, we have uh, areas here where we can do redevelopment. Oh good, I'm interested in that. Then he comes and, hey, I have horizontal wells that I would like to develop. Okay, where the usage? Oh, that's okay. Then Barbara comes and say, "Hey, we have CO two sequestration that we can do there." Oh, oh, okay. <coughs> then I come and I go like, "Hey, we have CO two EOR." And then that operator over there comes and they have an idea. That one has another one. That one has another. One. Suddenly I'm like, "What the heck? You guys get your act together. You're not getting a penny." So this is where. I think we have to step back. We have to all, with respect, sit down and talk about what is the vision for the entire county. How do we all help each other and put the, all the ideas together 
all operators together and see how we do this, right? If we don't get there, it's not gonna happen. So my two cents, and this is only my opinion, personal opinion, please do not use it. This is how I see things here. You have a conventional oil and gas business. Don't destroy it. That's your baseline, right? If I see it from a business point of view, low risk has low potential, but it's low risk. Don't touch that. Let's keep on doing that. You have CO2 in your oil. It has tremendous potential, but it will never happen. If we have Joe over there, Bill over there, uh, Jim over here, and everybody pulling in different directions, it won't work. Because the size of the investment that you need to do CO2 in your oil here, it is significant. You're gonna have to have a lot of pipeline, a lot of capturing facilities, a lot of processing, injection, and so on and so on and so on. So the, 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 in order for this to work, you need an economy of scale that will require flooding the entire urban and the entire county in phases. But you have that potential. Not a lot of people have that potential in the country. You do. So if you put your heads together, then you have a project that is low, medium risk, but has the highest potential. We're talking about billions, multiple, double-digit billions potential here, right? And has been the risk already. We know CO2 EOR works in this type of rock, mostly, right? But the one that don't work that well, it can't be economically viable because now the ones that are very successful can pay for the upfront costs. Then you have redevelopment options, right? You can do a little bit of water flooding here. You can do a little bit of perforation of bypass zones there. You can do optimization of the existing production, including lifting methods, chemicals, etc. Right? That would be my core business. So if I were now to talk to Mr. Bill, say, look, this is what I have. 2,000 horizontal wells and these many metric tons of CO2s EOR to do in the entire country, in the entire county, right? Now we're talking like I need half a million, half a billion for this, half a billion for that, an integrated plan in which we are overlapping geographically and by quality of reservoir, your entire picture. It's not like in some areas I'm gonna do this, in some areas I'm gonna do that, and some areas I'm gonna do that, but you have to have a strategic vision in which these things are all put together in one piece of paper, right? Then we go and say, this is my core business, conventional, CO2, EOR, and redevelopment. These are simple, easy to sell. The industry is very good at it. Everybody understands that, and it's money in, money out. So it can be financed, but you have to have the right structures, right? Then they're gonna ask, like, what is your upside? Well, there is horizontal drilling upside here and there, right? Not everywhere, but maybe we want to do that. There is chemical EOR too, here and there, but not everywhere, where CO2 maybe doesn't look that good. We have later carbon capture sequestration. Why am I going to go for carbon capture and leave the oil behind? Let's do the EOR first. Then when the EOR is on economic, then I move to the carbon capture. I'm not saying that we're not going to do it. Let's wait, right? And you still have that as an upside potential. Then you still have the plugging business because not every old well work, we want to use it. So still you have that, right? <laughs> now, if you look at this, you present a unified vision as an entire county of all the different portfolios of projects that you have. This is very attractive, but it has to be aligned. That is very attractive to Wall Street. They are dying to find ESG projects. <coughs> that are economic, right? The first three are economic, proven. They understand it, they finance it, they like that. The next three, there's gonna be all the other things that are the upside that they're gonna to like too. That's where you go next once you do the first one. Are you gonna do everything at once? No. Are, can you do everything at once? No, you can't. So you're gonna to have to split it, you're gonna to have to Organize it, divide it in phases, and start and learn and continue. But you have a 50 year project here that you can pursue. Right? So, suggestions. In order to get there, there are going to be some changes that they need to happen. Right? 
Uh, the first is there got to be acceptance between all the different parts that belong to this area that there is a need for a change, right? Then, if you get there, there got to be a commitment to change. Something has to change or nothing's going to happen. Things, the same things are going to continue as they used to, 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 to be uh, before. All parties are going to do something. Doesn't matter what you're going to lose. And you have to go in with that mindset. What you lose is not a loss, it is an investment. Why? Because you're going to end up with less of a much bigger picture, of a much bigger pie, right? That's the idea. What you develop is an investment. Then they're going to be external. You try to make changes as you see fit. But you have to be very careful that those may not be the changes that the partners that you need want, right? So you need to consider what investors want, what the banks want, what maybe a major operator wants, right? What the shareholders want, or all the stakeholders, landowners, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then at the end, what is legally possible? What is financially and operationally realistic, right? Then you go into the process. The process, there is a problem. As long as one of you takes over the process, the other side, it is not going to trust. And then there is going to be problems. And now when there is no trust, there is no progress. So it is highly recommended that you hire whoever and let that person guide the process, in which a third party that has no skin in the game, and all of you provide input but none of you drive the process. Otherwise, we are not gonna get there, right? And then you back engineer the problem. Understanding what are the goals, what is the business plan for the entire area, how do we get there? You're never gonna get 100% of everything you want, right? You're gonna be happy if you get to 60%, but everybody's gonna get less, but they're gonna get more at the end, in the long haul, right? Then you integrate the feedback of all the parts and all the pieces and all the different groups, and you redesign the structures, and then you get to work with Leo. And that takes a long time to get the business structure in place and to align all the parties that you have to be able to now move forward. Then comes the fun part, which is all the technical things that we were talking here today. Until you don't solve these things, I don't see any of the other technical things happening. Because the size of the investment, the capital requirements, the long-term view, the political stability, is not there yet, right? So you have the potential, but there are some things that may need to change before you get there to deploy the technologies, right? I talk too much. So this is my presentation. Thank you for your time. And I hope that at least this can um, initiate some conversation among you and, and sit down and, and just have a respectful debate about ideas. Thank you. No questions? Okay. Oh, God. I uh, totally agree with most everything you're saying, yeah. except there are some assumptions right here that uh, I agree the 100 million barrels of oil is there to recover. My question is you know, this cost of $30 a barrel. The reason being, you know, Chaparral putting on the MBU project, ultimately ended up bankrupt. They had well fallen out everywhere. You try to do the CO2 county-wise, you're going to have well fallen out everywhere. So this has got to be addressed, but there is a solution. It just has to be addressed. So you're, you made a great presentation. You've got the correct ideas because that's what needs to happen. We need to learn how to get together and figure all this out. Not, I'm not seeing any effort to do this until you guys came on the scene. So keep up the good work. Keep pushing. And Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, sir, one other thing. I'm sure you know, about, know this, but uh, 
I have seen several reservoirs where they have tried to, in this area, where they have tried to steal people. And they did it successfully from an oil production standpoint. But the CO2 ruined the residents because of the city and the massive corrosion. That's something that has to be considered. Yeah. So a little bit of feedback. Every CO2 EOR project that we have worked, there is no way around that this. Mostly we drill brand new injection wells and facilities. Brand new facilities. Uh, the main reason is sometimes you try to save here, there, and then you end up anyway spending the money. Yeah. So it's not even worth it to try. At least the projects that we design, the ones that we have worked with, almost everything goes from scratch. Uh, that's when we go into, yeah, this requires large capital investment. It's not, it's not a small one. I'm wearing two hats here. Yeah. I'm no state shareholder. I also worked in the chemical and has So, I want to see oil recovery going forward. And I've even worked on a few CO2 projects where we're doing mobility control. Mm -hmm. But our shareholders don't understand a lot of this stuff. So there's going to have to be a huge education pro process that goes on because it's all about the shareholders in those days down. My name is Donald Roach. Uh, I was wondering about your Native American experience. Was that when you worked for the federal government? Uh, thank you for that question. So, let me put it this way. There is a side of the federal government that was wishing that we could succeed, and a big side that was wishing that we won't succeed, right? So it was very complicated. But this is what we were able to achieve in some of the other areas. We eliminated BIA in any, any form and shape of what we do on a daily basis. BLM, state, and the only authority that we deal with in order of permitting or doing our projects is EPA, right? Pretty much it. Uh, it can be done everywhere, no, right? But, you know, as I said, every area is unique. And I'm pretty sure that you have another set of advantages and disadvantages. So we cannot translate what was done in area A to area B, or reservation A to <coughs> reservation B. But there are lessons learned that I think it can come across and benefit a lot of all the different reservations. Okay. Okay. So since the BIA controls everything that happens in Osage County, how do you expect to get around that? I can't give you the answer here. But I can tell you that we do not work with the BIA in another reservation, and that is for sure. I mean, and I should be able to even give you the references. You can contact the other tribes, and they, we were able to get a, around them. Okay, so since they've been there since 1906, and they're the fiduciary trust authority for the outside shareholders. I don't understand how you think you can just get around not having to deal with the BIA because all the rest of us operators, and I'm not, I don't operate oil and gas, but I certainly help a lot of them. Nobody's been able to do that yet. So I'm really curious about that. Plus, I saw your, uh, I heard that the contract that you guys had originally with the Minerals Council more or less wanted to nationalize all of Osage County. Is that true? Boy, that's something uh, very common also in different reservations. There is people that have different interests, different objectives, and they can take any piece of information that they get, they put it out there, and they make all kind of stories, right? I'm gonna share with you, we don't have time for drama. And when I saw that, I was like, you know what? There, there is a lot of crossfire here, so I just stay away from that. And I'm not gonna even, I can fight, data, engineering facts, and this and that, I don't have time for rumors, opinions, comments. That's not my strength, right? Um, I can tell you that there is people out there that, of course, they have an interest in keeping things as they are today, and they were probably rejecting any change or suggestion of changes that can create any kind of rumor. As I said before, we don't lease anything. We don't nationalize anything. 
I'm, I'm not saying that we can't do that here. But I'm, I'm not, I don't know if we can do that here. But I can tell you that we don't deal with them in other reservations. But potentially, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna argue yes or no. I'm just gonna say I haven't done even my case here, right? I, I don't know. I cannot comment about that here. I can only comment about what we did in another reservation. I don't think that we can give you that answer today. I'm just sharing my experience in another reservation. Any other question? How many tribes in the United States have you worked with? Actively today? Four. Four? Where are they? I cannot say. I gotta honor that. Any other question? Well, thank you very much. All right, guys, let's take about a five, ten minute break. Everybody, stretch your legs, get you something to drink, and things like that.